Well, we've been going through a series on prayer, on, we, on the Lord's Prayer specifically, and we uh, finished up that series last week. And one of the things that we pray in the Lord's Prayer is about the kingdom of God and, and God's kingdom coming down to earth. And we pray that God's will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And God, in his wonderful, um, amazing wisdom and creativity, has chosen and called us, his people, to be a part of building his kingdom and helping this transformation to come down. Now, God doesn't need us. You know, he can get along just fine with it without our help. Um, but he has chosen to use us. And that's a pretty amazing thing. He's take, taken a bunch of cracked pots like you and me. And he said, I can do amazing things when we put faith and when you put your faith and your trust in me. God says, I can use you. And that's a part of his plan and his purpose. And um, for the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a, a little study about uh, uh, on stewardship, um, biblical stewardship. We've called we've been called in this life, in this world to be stewards of God's creation. That means we're to be managers. We don't use the word stewards a whole lot um, today, but we're called to be managers. Now, that means that we don't own this world. We don't own anything in this world. Yeah, we think we have property. We own a house. We own a car. Well, um, actually, God owns it all. And he's allowed us to be managers of this great, great creation that he's given us. And he's called us uh, to join together and to build his kingdom. He's called us to be a, a body, his body, the church of Jesus Christ on earth. And this morning we're going to begin this study by looking at, um, at chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a wonderful book. Uh, it was written because there were problems in the church. Can you believe that? That early on, there were actually problems in the early church? Because it's made up of people just like you and me, sinners. And it didn't take long for problems to crop up in the church. And so 1 Corinthians is, is there were probably three letters that Paul wrote. And they are responses that Paul wrote back to... Um, um, to the members of the church, they wrote a letter to Paul. And they said, we have some issues going on in the church that we would like for you to address. See, Paul founded the church in Corinth. And Corinth was an amazing city. It was a cosmopolitan city. It was a trade center um, uh, for the world. You know, major trades passed right through Corinth. And it was... A very worldly city. Uh, they loved to debate. They, they highly valued wisdom and, and debating. Just the, the act of debating was almost as, as important as who won the debates. But it was a very cosmopolitan city. It was also a very sinful city. Very much like a, a Las Vegas of, of today. In fact, they even developed a term for corrupt people and they called them Corinthians. Corinthianizers, people who were very corrupt. It was not a positive term. But Paul went into this city, into this situation, and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he began building a church. But as that church began to grow and to flourish, there were problems that, that came along in the midst of that. And one of those things were, were um, divisions that happened in the church. And basically, Paul was saying... That it's spiritual immaturity. They're babes in Christ. But I want us to go through this and, and uh, look at this. He's talking about how to build the church. And he tells us to be careful how you build. And as you know, it's important to build on the right foundation whenever you build. Even Jesus told some parables about building your house on the, on the rock. Or a house on the sand and the water comes up and it just washes it away. Think about the three little pigs and the way they built their, their uh, houses. And, and um, you know, a couple of them uh, were easily gotten rid of, but the house that was built with brick um, stood the test of time. And, and so Paul, um, Paul gives us a foundation. Well, let's go through. 
and see what Paul has to say to us today because God's word is living and it's active and it's, it's like a two-edged sword and it, and it cuts into our hearts and what's going on to our lives. But we can learn his word is wisdom and it's truth and it stands the test of time. So he begins by saying, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. He begins by saying brothers, and and then today we would say brothers and sisters. That was understood at the time. But he's saying this book is written, this passage is written to believers It's not Christians versus non-Christians. This is written to believers. Basically, it's written to immature Christians and to uh, more mature Christians. But Paul begins by saying, um, we're all in this together, speaking to everybody here. We're believers in Jesus Christ. But he said, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ. And so we see this contrast of of spiritual, the ways of God, and worldly, the ways of the flesh. Uh, Paul often uses the term uh, sarx in Greek, which means flesh. And it means the worldly stuff. Um, And he says, but you're infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. For you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Let's just stop right here and, and go back. Other places in scripture talks about when you become a believer, you're an infant in Christ. You're a spiritual baby. And, and I think about uh, Emily and, and Amos, Emily and Brandon and, and Amos. And, and here's this, this infant. What do infants do? Basically nothing but, but cry. I think of Andrea in the back. Um, they... They cry. When they have a demand, all they do is is they cry, they scream out, maybe they coo a little bit as time goes on. But in the very beginning, they are 100% dependent upon someone else, upon their parents, upon other people. It's amazing that that human beings, that God in his his wonderful creation uh, designed us in a way that we're probably some of the most helpless babies uh, in, in his kingdom. You know, other animals can get along better than, than us. But we're, we're 100% dependent. We can't feed ourselves. We can't change our diapers. We can't walk. We can't do much of anything but sleep and let others know, hey, here I am, fix me. I have a need. And so they cry out. And you know, that's fine. When we become Christians, we don't have all the answers. We're born again. We're born from above. We accept God's plan of salvation for us, meaning that Christ died on the cross for our sins. We are not worthy, but he is worthy and what he has done. So Jesus Christ is our foundation. And when we accept that, we become a a babe in Christ. And that's great. And that's why we have the church and we're called to come into the church and the church is to disciple, train, equip um, young believers because it doesn't happen automatically. There's effort that takes place for us to grow and to mature in our faith. But Paul is saying here, you've been babies for a long time. Now you think about Amos right now, you know, he's totally dependent upon Brandon and Emily and Probably grandmother and granddad and you know other things. But but that's fine. But what if five years down the road Amos can't feed himself? He can't walk. He can't talk. He can't do much of anything for himself. 
we would think something is wrong. Something's drastically wrong. That's really sad. Well, spiritually, that's what Paul is saying right here. You begin as infants, but you shouldn't stay as infants. And he's, he uses the evidence for being um, um, still worldly is that there's, there's jealousy and there's quarreling, bickering, jealousy, fighting, little, little things going on in the midst of the Corinthian church. And he says, you know, you don't deny it. You've talk, written me a letter saying this is what's going on. Um, are you not acting like mere men? And then what was going on here, one of the things that was going on is that they were, some were following Paul. They were divided into groups. They had this celebrity culture. You know, Paul was a super preacher for some of them. And for others, it was Apollos. He was a Greek guy, and he, he was very eloquent in the way he taught and led people. And he, he was really funny, you know, had a good sense of humor, and people really liked him. And, and then later we'll see that Cephas was all, all, also a, a part of this. And so they're saying, yeah, I think Paul's the greatest. No, I think Apollos is the greatest. Have you heard Cephas? And so they were divided about that. You know, and we still have in our... Uh, with all of our multimedia and things, you know, we have some of that celebrity culture today, too, don't we? <laughs> Just think about, uh, you know, the, the whole football today is uh, NFL football Sunday, and, and yesterday was college football Saturday, and, and we think of our, our heroes and the people that we look up to, and we love to create celebrities, don't we? We love to look up to people. And there are certain pastors. I do it myself. I think, wow, this guy's really a great communicator. What a wonderful teacher this person is. And we see that. But they're taking their eyes off of Jesus Christ. And they're putting it onto another person, a mere mortal person. And Paul addresses this. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? That's me. Paul is writing this. We're only servants. We're people who point to Jesus Christ. We point to somebody else. And I think of John the Baptist here. And Jesus called him one of the greatest men who have ever lived. John the Baptist. Why was that? Because he understood his mission. He said, I must decrease. And he, being Jesus, must increase. My role is to point to Jesus Christ, causing people, asking people to repent, to be baptized, but look to Jesus, not to me. Yeah, I've got a great ministry going here, lots of followers and things, but I'm pointing to Jesus Christ. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. That's how great he is. That's what Paul is addressing here. We're only servants through whom you came to believe. We have a calling. We have a mission. We have a purpose. God has a plan for our lives. That's to tell others about, about Jesus. You, um, through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every person. He's gifted us with spiritual abilities, natural talents. He's given us experiences in this world. He's put people in our place, in, in, um, you know, in our uh, relationship with us so that we can learn and grow and mature and be used of God to build up his church, the one body. I planted, so his purpose, Paul, was to, to plant. He planted this church. He planted the seed. Apollos watered it. He came along and, and gave further teaching, helped disciple and build up uh, the church. But it was God who made it grow. God is the one who provides the growth. So neither he knew plant, who plants nor waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. It's all about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what you want. It's ultimately what about what does God want? 
The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So he's using some different analogies here. So he's talking about agriculture. Um, you know, you, you plant things, you water them, but it's God who makes the growth. You know, what a beautiful analogy is the, the gardening and how many different ones does, does Jesus use about using agricultural analogies. And he says that we're going to be rewarded according to our labor, according to how we've used the gifts that God has given us. Now, we have to be very careful here. Who is, who is Paul writing to? Christians. People who are already believers. People who are already going into heaven. So this is not about whether you're going to heaven or not. Because that's based on the work of Jesus Christ, not on what we do. But what we're called to do is in response to what Jesus has done for us, to live out our lives in gratitude towards him. To use the gifts and abilities um, that, that uh, God has given us. So you're gonna, we are going to be rewarded in heaven based on how we've lived out our lives after becoming believers in Jesus Christ. Because we're in this thing together. Fellow workers, we're God's field, we're God's building. By the grace God has given me, Paul is saying, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. Oh, let me go on. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire is judgment, with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives... He will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. It's not your salvation here, but only as one escaping through the flames. You're going to get into heaven, but it's going to be rough going, uh, maybe um, getting to that place. So Paul laid the foundation. Foundation is Jesus Christ. And that's the only foundation for the church. I, I was teaching a couple of weeks ago. I was leading a Bible study with a, a group of, of pastors. And we were talking about um, in the Gospel of Matthew 25. And that's where Jesus gives the, the parable about separating the sheep from the goat. The judgment that is coming. And, and the judgment was how they were going to be separated was how they treated other people. How they visited those in prison, how they ministered to those who were sick, how they fed and clothed other people. And, and um, there were two groups here, and one group responded, well, well, when did we do these things for you, Jesus? And Jesus said, whenever you've done it to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it unto me. And then for those who were going to be excluded, the goats, he says, they said, well, well when did we not do that? And he said, when you have not done it to the least of these. And I think about that so often when, when people come and, and, and ask for things and, and have needs. And, and I really wrestle with that. What does that mean in, in the church today? But then there were some people in this group and they said... Well, you know, the, the Muslims do good things and, and some, some Buddhists do some, some really good works and doing some good things. And I said, whoa, whoa, that's another gospel. 
The gospel is on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's the only foundation upon which we build. And throughout scripture, Jesus Christ is used as a, as a solid foundation, as the rock that, upon which we stand, the Psalms and, and other places. And, and another pastor said, you know, well, I've read a book about, uh, a good book on, on universalism, which says, you know, everybody's going to be saved in the end. God just loves everybody and everybody's going to be saved in the end. And I thought, well, that might be a good book, but that's not Christianity. Because Christianity is based on Jesus Christ. And he is the foundation. And no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to say there's going to be some testing. And you can build, you can use a lot of different tools when you, when you build something, right? A lot of different materials. And, and some materials are really good and some not so good and some just not very good at all. And Paul says there's going to be some testing. And, and the testing is going to reveal the fire. And we studied in the Lord's Prayer about how lead us not into temptation. And we talked about God doesn't tempt us to do evil things. But God does allow testing to happen. And we, we, uh, we, we talked about Abraham and, and Isaac as the you know, supreme example of, of God providing um, a lamb uh, for us. And that's what he has done uh, through us. But there's going to be testing. And that, that, that judgment is coming. There's going to come a time when we are going to be judged for how we lived our lives. It's not going to be a judgment as to whether we as Christians get into heaven or not. But rather about the rewards that we will find in heaven. And um, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. See, this is reward here. Um, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Again, he's once saved, always saved. You're not going to lose your salvation um, um, once you believe in Jesus Christ. Um, there's a passage in John and, sit, and Jesus is praying to his father in heaven. He said, and no one that you have given me can snatch him out of my hands. God holds on to us just like a, a child, a young child. You're, you're crossing the street and, and the child may run out and try to dart out. But the parent grabs the, the child's hand and he holds on and he prevents that child from running out in front of a car. God holds on to us and no one can snatch us out of his hand. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? He's bringing it home here. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. The temple here, he's, Paul is saying, is it's no longer that, that big, mag, majestic building in Jerusalem that, uh, where the, the uh, presence of God once dwelt. After Jesus Christ broke the power of sin and death, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, giving us direct access to the Father. And we have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a nice building. This is a nice place to come and, and to worship God. A few weeks ago, um, Chris, Chris and I went to, um, uh, went to, to a, a funeral service, and it was in a Catholic church. And it was a beautiful, magnificent um, Catholic cathedral. It was marble everywhere. It, it was beautiful. But that's stuff made with human hands. And as magnificent as it was. And it, and it helps to point you, when you walk in, you just feel a sense of awe. And that's a good thing that maybe we've lost sometimes. But, but, um, but it's still something built with human hands. But in this temple dwells the Holy Spirit. A gift from God who enables us to do things we could never do on our own. The Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin so that we can confess it and be forgiven of it. 
It is the the Holy Spirit who gives us spiritual gifts to do what we could never do on our own. And he says that we are um, that temple. And when he says you, the temple is sacred, the temple is single. But he says, and you are that temple. And the you there is plural. He's talking about the whole church there in Corinth. He's talking about us. We are the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For in the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. And so then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ. Christ is of God. So he started out talking about divisions that were going on in the church and people arguing over one thing or one another or, or uh, issues going on in the life of the church. But then he concludes just talking about the unity, how we are all in Christ when we are mature and seeking him and filled with his spirit and active and moving and growing in our life, in faith. And we will inherit the inheritance of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty amazing concept that Paul tells us about in Ephesians. And remember that, that um, in Corinthians, they valued wisdom. And, and if you could read chapter 1 and, and 2, and it talks about um, wisdom versus, you know, who, who we are in Christ, the foolishness of Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, to those who don't believe. We have those same issues today. There are people who say, well, oh, we don't need to talk about that blood running down from the cross and that kind of stuff. You know, let's just talk about how God loves us. And that's true. It's it's true. But it's through the blood of Christ that he shows us his ultimate love and dying in our place. So he talks about uh, the the cross and, and wisdom. And he said that God has chosen the foolish things, the foolish people of the world to confound the wise. And that gives me great hope and comfort that God can use a fool like me to make a difference in the world when I'm trusting and seeking and following after him. So it's a call to grow up. God wants us to grow up. It's a, it's a call to focus on Jesus Christ and to build on his foundation not on the foundation of anyone else. It's a call to mature physically. And that means we have to take responsibility for our own actions, our own maturity. We can't depend on just other people and say, well, you know, I'm just not growing, just not getting anything. Well, grow up. Take your own responsibility. You can read and study God's word. You can pray. You can grow in your faith. You can understand more and more about what it means to worship God. Each of us have been given gifts in order to build up God's church, the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul warns us to be careful how we build. There is only one foundation, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, construction workers need good food in order to have the, the energy and, and to build a good foundation of, on Jesus Christ. And God has given us this Lord's Supper as a continual reminder of who he is, of what he has done, that this is our foundation and nothing else. A little bit of bread, 
a little cup of juice. It's all we need when it's inspired and filled with the Holy Spirit working within us. This is a reminder of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Let us go to him in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you and we confess there's so much that we don't understand about this life, the world around us, what is going on. Sometimes it seems like it's so chaotic and so divided and and yet you call us to be one. And this is one place we can come together at the table of Jesus Christ. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will bring us unity and maturity in the faith and that you will continue to, to mold us and to shape us into the people that you want us to be. I pray for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within everyone who believes to continue to do his work and so that when people see us, they don't just see us as mere men and women, but rather as followers of Jesus Christ and we reflect the life and the love of Jesus Christ to others. Help us to walk by faith, Lord, and not by sight. We thank you for this meal, a simple reminder because we are so forgetful. Thank you, Father, for this cup, for the bread, and for the meaning behind it. Your great love, the sacrificial death of your Son, Jesus Christ so that we might come together as the family of God and one day dwell forever and ever in your presence. Feed us now, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.